Great, thank you. Um, so first I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Um, and uh, I'm going to specifically give a few examples uh, within the context of multi-scale and multimodal data fusion, um, focusing on integrating imaging and molecular data. So I hope I don't have to convince you that um, machine learning has been successfully used for biomedical data analysis for several heterogeneous data types. Um, not sure why my video turned off. Okay, sorry about that. Um, um, so in terms of different types of biomedical data, what, what do I mean with that? Uh, this can be, for example, clinical data, molecular data, um, imaging data, uh, and these are all sort of uh, more and more routinely available uh, for complex diseases and for patients, especially in the area of oncology. Um, and many studies have shown that biomarker discovery from these different types of data can contribute to precision medicine. What do I mean with precision medicine? Well, essentially to optimize treatment of specific patients or subsets of patients using biomarkers. And original work in precision medicine has been mostly targeted at discovery of molecular biomarkers, um, primarily genomic and transcriptomic biomarkers. Uh, here are a few examples. For example, there's uh, commercial uh, platforms available for these diseases. There's a gene expression assay for thyroid nodule diagnosis, a gene expression assay for breast cancer uh, treatment decisions, and a methylation assay for diagnosis of colorectal cancer. And the goal in this, all these applications is to accurately assign either diagnosis or treatments to patients. But still a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, biomarkers are still needed in lots of different areas uh, within oncology and also outside of oncology for a better uh, assessment of treatment. For example, in glioma to distinguish pseudo progression versus real progression, in neurodegenerative diseases to distinguish mild cognitive impairment from Alzheimer's disease, for example. However, we argue that molecular biomarkers might not be enough. Uh, and we want to also consider other routinely available data, such as clinical data and image data. And particularly through the, um, thanks to evolution and quantitative image analysis, we can now also um, quantitatively analyze whole slide images and radiographic images. And they can provide additional sources of biomarkers. And so there's a huge need to develop models that can efficiently integrate all these different types of data and multi-scale data in general. So what do I mean with multi-scale data? Essentially, technologies that are able to characterize all these different entities at different scales, ranging from molecules, cells, to tissues, and to the whole patient. Um, and examples of these technologies uh, at each of these scales are uh, sequencing DNA and RNA sequencing for mo uh, molecular data types, whole slide images and immunohistochemistry to characterize cells, uh, radio radiology or radiographic images such as MR, CT and PET to characterize tissues, and electronic health records to give uh, more data about the patient and their history, for example. So what is the rationale behind this? Is wh why do we want to integrate uh, multi-scale technologies and the data that result from them? Is uh, One of the reasons for that is because they sample heterogeneity of diseases in different ways. Um, with molecular data, we get very deep detail of one sample or a piece of tissue, um, for, uh, for example, even single cell. Um, with immunohistochemistry or digital pathology, we get uh, a slice of tissue and we get a, a detail of the cells and the composition of cells of a slice. And with radiographic images, for example, get 3D, lower resolution, but 3D information of a whole organ or tissue or in the context of oncology, a tumor as a whole. So there's a huge opportunity to study synergy and the expectation that combining all these different types of data could compensate for potential heterogeneity in these diseases. So today I'm going to try to uh, give you examples of three um, projects, um, primarily focusing on the integration of imaging and molecular data. First, I'm going to show some um, very focused work on linking DNA methylation signatures with histopathology images. Then uh, I will um, present a framework, a supervised framework for predicting overall survival, which we tested across uh, a number of different cancer sites from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And finally, if I still have time left, I will focus on uh, supervised prediction of overall survival in adult and pediatric brain tumors using multimodal data fusion. So let's get started. 
Um, first, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about our work linking methylation or epigenomic data with uh, histopathology images. Just a brief uh, piece of background. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware that DNA methylation uh, is an important uh, process in cancer and oncology. Um, and it's essentially the transfer of a methyl group to a CG dinucleotide, which can cause gene expression silencing. And this process is often deregulated in cancer, causing hypermethylation and hypomethylation. Um, hypermethylation can, uh, can uh, be a process to uh, deactivate tumor suppressor genes, uh, while hypomethylation can be a process to activate oncogenes, similarly to other uh, genetic alterations such as copy number and DNA mutations. Uh, two examples here at the bottom, MGMT hypermethylation glioblastoma is a well-known um, event, and also uh, methylation of BRCA1 in ovarian breast cancer is an alternative mechanism uh, to uh, inactivate these uh, tumor suppressor genes. Uh, another important uh, aspect in oncology is the um, so-called SIMP uh, phenotype, which is a, a global hypermethylation phenotype. Uh, which has been observed in a couple of different cancers, uh, including colorectal cancer, glioma, and AML. And what this does is essentially it defines subtypes or subgroups of patients that have this hypermethylation phenotype, and these uh, likely will behave differently uh, with treatments. So we developed um, a method to um, define hypermethylation, hypomethylation, and define methylation states uh, using a combination of DNA methylation and RNA sequencing data. Um, and this method is available as an R package, and I don't have time uh, right now to go into the details of this method. Um, secondly, um, we are going to link these methylation states to histopathology images. Uh, these are digital images, high resolution images of uh, tissues, and they uh, are often, it's prohibitive to manually interpret these images by pathologists. Um, but they provide complementary information um, on top of molecular data, such as uh, they can give us information about cellular heterogeneity, cellular structure, cell type composition, um, and so on. So we want to link these two types of data together uh, for patients where we actually have collected both of these types of data. So we're going to um, start with these uh, images. We're going to extract features from these images. Then we are going to use methylmix on DNA methylation data, define DM values, which are differential methylation states, uh, which means that essentially these are uh, categorizing or binarizing genes into either hypo, uh, normal, or hypermethylation states. And then we're going to associate these two uh, with each other. So this is the data that we used for this uh, project. Uh, we used uh, two uh, data from two cancers. We used uh, almost a thousand uh, patients, uh, glioma patients, and about uh, just over 500 clear cell, real cell carcinoma. Uh, in terms of the molecular data, um, we used uh, tumor and normal DNA methylation integrated with RNA-seq data, and this is the input essentially for methylmix. Uh, once we applied methylmix to this data set, we found about uh, 927 methylmix genes for glioma and 366 methylmix genes for renal cell carcinoma. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, methylmix essentially dichotomizes these genes into these methylation states. So now we also have uh, whole site images uh, for the same patients uh, from TCGA, from the GDC portal. And what we did with these uh, images is we extracted uh, what we call morphometric features. And these are essentially the equivalent of radiomics features that the previous speaker um, uh, talked about. And um, so this is a very similar process uh, of extracting features from these images. Um, and we essentially summarize these uh, features using uh, standard uh, first or order statistics. So what, what do we want to do? Well, we want to see if we can predict these methylation states from these uh, morphometric features. Um, we, first, we, we try to see if we can predict single genes followed by uh, clustering of metamic states uh, and predicting clusters. Um, and we used six common classifiers, including, for example, random forest and SVMs. Uh, I'm going to quickly go to the results. Um, so essentially, uh, these are so the results, a summary of the results for gliomas for single genes, where we see that most classifiers essentially can predict uh, these genes with an error on the rock curve of about 0.7. Um, and essentially, only naive bees is, is not performing very well. Uh, but most of the other typical uh, classifiers or machine learners can actually 
uh, quite reasonably predict the methylation states of these genes using these morphometric features. Uh, here are two genes that I just wanted to highlight, which are genes that have um, higher or, or at the top of the list in terms of error on the rock curve and precision recall. Um, and not surprisingly, both of these genes are involved in cell cycle progression, um, since we, uh, we expect to see uh, progression or cell cycle progression uh, reflected in the histopathology image. Next, we, we also uh, wanted to investigate whether clustering uh, the methylation uh, data improved the results because we don't necessarily expect to be able to predict each single gene from the uh, image data. Um, so we cluster the genes um, and define different uh, subtypes and based on some internal statistics, the solution with five clusters gave the best results. Uh, and then we try to predict uh, each of these five uh, methylation clusters uh, using the morphometric features. Um, as you can see, uh, only uh, the results of cluster two are essentially not great. Uh, all the other clusters have actually quite well, uh, quite good performance with uh, Aaron Rock curves of above 0.8, uh, so except cluster two. Uh, and again, the classifiers behave more or less uh, similarly across uh, all these uh, clusters. Um, so here are uh, more details about um, uh, this work. Um, and uh, I just want to summarize um, this first part where essentially we wanted to um, do a proof of principle to see if there was any relationship between morphometric features extracted from whole slide images and how they could be related to uh, epigenomic patterns. Um, and we looked at single gene methylation states and methylation clusters uh, in essentially two cancer types, uh, glioma and real cell carcinomas. And we essentially conclude from the study that um, image biomarkers uh, can reflect these molecular properties. And the most interesting use case could be is that um, uh, pathologists could immediately get an idea of potential methylation patterns from uh, analyzing the um, histopathology slides without having to generate methylation data. Now let me turn to the next project that I want to talk about, which is a more uh, broad framework for multi-scale data fusion using biomedical data. Um, uh, again, in this project, we used uh, data from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And what I'm showing you here is uh, the least aggressive uh, cancers, which is, I believe, 16 uh, cancer sites within TCGA uh, and their overall survival uh, data. Uh, as you can see, uh, several of these uh, cancers have uh, pretty long uh, follow-ups. Compared to, for example, uh, the most um, aggressive cancer sites uh, within TCGA, where um, the, these, pa these patients have uh, more poor prognosis. Uh, and the main reason I'm showing you this is that there's huge uh, heterogeneity within uh, or between each of these cancer sites uh, across different tissues. So, um, these are the different uh, data types, uh, uh, cancer sites that we considered for this study, where we are going to develop a data fusion model integrating clinical, molecular, and image data to predict overall survival. Uh, so we used um, 22 cancer sites, uh, which uh, total about uh, 8,000 patients, uh, where breast cancer uh, had to mo contributed to most patients, and chromophobe uh, renal cell, uh, cell carcinomas is the cancer site with the least amount of patients. Uh, and on average, we had about 376 patients per cancer site. So what data modalities uh, did we include? So we used clinical data that was common across all these cancer sites, including age, sex, race, and grade. Uh, next, we used gene expression data based on the um, use of several gene signatures that are predictive of clinical outcome. Uh, we also used microRNAs because um, several reports have shown that uh, microRNA signatures exist that are predictive of clinical outcome. And finally, we also used uh, whole slide images. Uh, um, as, they, uh, as what I said before, uh, these images can uh, contain information about cellular heterogeneity uh, and to develop the necessary technologies to combine both molecular clinical and image data. So one thing that we had to um, account for is the potential for missing data across all these different um, uh, modalities and uh, cancer-sized uh, data sets. Um, as you can see, several of these, uh, these, these uh, patients have a have, uh, um, high amount of missing data. Um, 
So we needed to develop a model that can account for uh, missing data, but not necessarily for missing data within each modality, but also for missing data between modalities where maybe not all patients have all modalities available. So to account for this, we essentially develop a model where each data modality first is um, uh, represented or embedded in a single feature vector using what we call a similarity loss, uh, which is parameterized with a parameter called M. And this parameter essentially defines how much similarity is required between each of the different data modalities. Uh, if this uh, M is big, then we allow each of the different data modalities to be very different from each other. Uh, versus if this parameter is very small, then it means that we, we essentially compress all information in a common dimension and there is uh, essentially no added information anymore. So we essentially want a trade off between these two extremes. Uh, and I'll explain this in more detail. So we then uh, calculate this for each every pair of patients. And then we learn essentially similar encodings across all these data modalities. Uh, and this whole setup essentially allows to train our model in the presence of missing data modalities because we are forcing these modalities to be encoded into a feature vector that uh, contains some similarity to the other data modalities. So this is the setup. So we have here the four uh, data modalities. We have gene expression data, microRNA data, clinical data, and host slide images. And in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, the models that we uh, develop for each of these uh, uh, different types of data. And here, what I'm showing you uh, in the middle of the slide is the encoding of each of these data modalities using the similarity loss, which is what I just explained, where we essentially force these modalities to be uh, encoded in this uh, one dimensional feature vector. Of course, this is uh, not enough. We also need to use this model for uh, prediction of clinical outcome, which I will explain later. First, so how are we representing uh, each of these data modalities? Uh, for the clinical data, we use a very straightforward uh, feed forward neural network. Then for the molecular, two molecular data types, the gene expression data and microRNA data, we use a highway network uh, with, the 10 layer, with 10 layers. Um, and uh, even though that uh, a neural net is not necessarily uh, recommended for modeling mRNA or microRNA uh, data, we wanted to use this because we want the whole model, the multimodal model to be able to be trained end to end, including both imaging, the clinical and the molecular data. In terms of the molecular data, the whole slide images. So this is a, a different approach than the previous project that I explained to you, where here we are using a fully uh, convolutional neural network approach, where we are going to use a patch-based uh, model, where we are going to patch the whole slide images uh, using patches of two, 224 by 224 and repeat this 200 times. And we will use uh, the so-called squeeze net model, which is uh, uh, an, uh, a potential um, is a CNN model that has been used on uh, images, including ImageNet. Um, we need to do this patching because these whole slide images uh, are very high resolution and we cannot fit the whole image uh, in a CNN model. So this is the squeeze net model, which is um, uh, cons which consists of these so-called fire modules where essentially we squeeze and expand the, 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 the data, the image data uh, in a successive uh, number of modules very similar to other types of uh, models that have been trained on ImageNet. So now um, uh, I've, uh, I hope I've explained to you some of the details of each of the different uh, data modalities. Um, I've defined the similarity loss, uh, but now we also need to define another loss, which will help us to predict uh, overall survival. So essentially we are going to add a Cox loss, which optimizes the C index and gives us an idea of how well we can predict uh, that or overall survival of these patients. Um, and we're going to essentially optimize the two, these two losses at the same time. So we want the model to predict overall survival across all these patients. But at the same time, we have the similarity loss, which uh, will force the different modalities to be encoded in similar or correlated feature vectors. Um, and this essentially allows to uh, account for uh, missing data modalities. So here are some uh, results. Uh, so this uh, is a visualization of uh, the multimodal model uh, using a Disney plot where we essentially wanted to look um, uh, at the similarity between uh, these patients across the different uh, tissue types. Um, here are some annotations. So we can see, for example, that ovarian cancer is very different from the other um, 
cancer sites, also brain tumors are very different and kidney chromophobe cancers. Um, this just to, to get, get some insight into this uh, multimodal model uh, and definitely more work can be done on visualizing these type of models. Uh, next, um, we primarily focused on how well we can uh, use this multimodal model to predict uh, overall survival. Uh, again, you can see all the different cancers um, in, in, on the left here and how many samples we have. And here's the baseline performance. So this is how well we can predict uh, overall survival uh, using the four data modalities. Then next, uh, what we uh, investigated first was the concept of multimodal dropout. Dropout is a concept that is used very often in training uh, convolutional nets. However, what we did is we, we essentially forced um, uh, certain modalities to be removed from the data. And when we did that, we actually improved the performance of this uh, framework in almost all um, cancer sites. So uh, in, in almost all of these experiments, we were able to improve the performance of, for predicting survival when we uh, forced uh, missing data modalities in the training data. Another uh, important thing that we uh, did is we essentially trained this model using pan-cancer data. Uh, because as you can see here on the left, when you look at the number of samples for each of these cancer sites, some of them have, have very few samples, for example, kidney chromophobe. So if we uh, um, sample a training data set of let's say 70%, then we, we likely won't have enough data to train a model. So instead, what we do is we actually sample 70% training data of all cancers and train a single model um, on each of these uh, cancers in a pan-cancer fashion and then test either uh, in a pan-cancer setting but also uh, for each cancer uh, separately. Uh, and this is what you can see here. So when we do uh, pan-cancer training, th these are the performances. Um, and when you compare this with single cancer training, when we train a model only on data from that cancer, we essentially can improve uh, uh, virtually for all cancer sites the performance drastically. Only in the context, uh, only for this cancer site, which is uh, renal cell uh, carcinomas, which are clear cell carcinomas, I believe, uh, we saw a small drop in the performance. But virtually for all other cancer sites, there's a huge um, improvement in uh, testing this model. Uh, next, we also uh, did some experiments to figure out what are the essential uh, data modalities. And we found out that for, uh, microRNA was one of the more important uh, data modalities for most of the cancers. Uh, when we compare uh, the model combining all four data modalities versus a model which only uses microRNA uh, and clinical data, we found that in uh, eight cancer sites, uh, the models uh, did better or equally well. Similarly, um, uh, we tested if uh, dropping uh, gene expression data or mRNA data from the, the full model, uh, if that uh, was possible and which cancer sites would be able to uh, lose this data. And we found that about six cancer sites uh, did not really need uh, the gene expression data. However, uh, in three cases, the performance dropped drastically, uh, uh, suggesting that in these cancers, uh, gene expression data is very important. Um, and, and I want to point out one example, which is uh, acute myeloid leukemia, which drops 14%, um, which, is, which is consistent with literature since gene expression uh, patterns in leukemia have been used for the past uh, decades to predict prognosis and have been shown to be very uh, robust. So to summarize this part, um, uh, we essentially developed a, a model, a potential way of integrating these different uh, data modalities and used it to predict uh, prognosis, prognosis of cancer patients. Um, the idea is to develop this uh, common vector representation uh, across all these different uh, modalities and also account for missing data. Uh, we found out that um, pan, pan cancer learning is important and uh, that primarily the microRNA uh, data was, was most essential for predicting uh, survival. Let me go to the, oh, and here I, um, uh, you can read more about um, this work. Let me now go to the last part, which is a preliminary work on uh, developing, developing a data fusion model, uh, primarily focused on adult and pediatric brain tumors. Uh, 
So uh, I already defined um, multi-scale data before. Uh, essentially, uh, we are interested in bringing all these different types of data, molecular data, clinical data, cellular data together in a single model. Now, the, the question in this project is, can we develop such a model specifically for uh, brain tumor patients and predict overall survival? So here is the data that we used for this. So we started uh, uh, again with uh, the cancer tumor atlas data from uh, adult gliomas, which is about a thousand samples, where again, we had similar data modalities. We had the clinical data, gene expression data, and histopathology data. Secondly, we used uh, pediatric glioma data from the kids first project, um, which essentially um, has, we have essentially the same data modalities for this um, data set. Uh, but only about 200 patients. And then uh, we also used uh, data from two other um, uh, pediatric uh, brain tumor types, namely medulloblastoma and ependymoma, where we had smaller amounts of data available, namely 60 medulloblastoma patients and 47 uh, pediatric ependymomas. And the reason we, we are using these data sets is we wanted to test uh, transfer learning in the multimodal context. So some uh, brief uh, data about uh, pre-processing. Um, so we do very standard pre-processing similar to the previous project um, where we, uh, we do a, a foreground detection to detect the tissue. And we again use a patch-based model to train on the histopathology data uh, and some data transformations. And for the gene expression data, we use very standard uh, pre-processing uh, for RNA-seq data. So um, in this project, we really focus more on uh, different ways in terms of data fusion and how we are going to uh, combine the gene expression and uh, histopathology image data. So for both of these uh, types of data, we need uh, first a feature extraction module uh, where essentially we use um, a, a ResNet uh, model for uh, the images uh, uh, that is uh, pre-trained on uh, ImageNet. Uh, secondly, we use, uh, again, a multi-layer perceptron for the gene expression RNA data. Um, and then uh, we have a sim similar COX loss module where we use its a standard COX loss then to predict overall survival of these brain tumor patients. Uh, here are the results uh, when we use each modality separately. Um, and the, on the top, I'm showing you the results of pediatric glioma and at the bottom for adult glioma. Uh, and here you can uh, see how we can, uh, the performance of, this, uh, of these models, where we use two uh, performance metrics, uh, the concordance index and the Breer score. The concordance index gives us a relative measure of how well we actually can predict survival uh, by, uh, and it can be interpreted as if we have two random patients, what is the chance that we can uh, rank them based on their survival? versus the Brea score, which is more like uh, error metric, where we, it gives us an idea of how, uh, how much uh, mistakes we make uh, for each individual patient. So it's more similar to a mean square error. So, and it's also important to, to mention that for a concordance index, the, the higher to one, uh, the better the result, whereas the Brea score, uh, we want to uh, essentially focus on lower scores, uh, since this is more like an error metric. Um, next, we wanted to look for uh, and, and compare a number of different types of data fusion of these uh, different uh, data modalities. I'm going to show you three uh, ways uh, that we are uh, integrating these data, uh, feature fusion, late fusion, and joint training fusion. Um, first, uh, in, in terms of feature fusion, uh, essentially what we are doing is we have two separate models. We have a ResNet model with patches uh, for the images. Uh, and a simple neural net. Uh, and then we essentially concatenate the output of these models, which is then put to another model uh, with a Cox model to predict survival. Uh, this is the late fusion uh, model where essentially we have um, uh, separate models that make a decision, uh, which is visualized here. And once we have a prediction of the survival, we just compare, combine these two predictions into a simple Cox regression model. And then finally, we have joint fusion. In, the, in this case, the models are actually trained end to end, and there is information flow from the, the RNA model to the whole slide image model to the ResNet model, and both models are trained at the same time to predict survival. And the whole idea of this setup is really to compare all these different uh, data fusion uh, methodologies.
So here are again some results. Um, uh, on the, um, so this is for adult glioma. On the top uh, of the table, we have the single modality results. And then here at the bottom, we have all the different uh, data fusion uh, models where um, uh, these preliminary results are suggesting that um, using uh, these different, uh, using a combination of, of these data, we can definitely improve the performance in terms of concordance index and brief score. Um, similarly, for the pediatric glioma data, where uh, joint training fusion of both the pathology images and the gene expression data uh, essentially is leading to the best results. Um, here are also some survival curves to visualize these results. Uh, where um, uh, at the top, uh, we have uh, all the single models, which is the pathology model, the gene expression model, and the clinical model. And at the bottom, I'm showing you two uh, data fusion models, the feature fusion and the joint training fusion model. Uh, next, uh, we also tested uh, the, these models uh, in, in a transfer learning context, as we wanted to figure out if a model trained on adult glioma could be used in pediatric glioma and vice versa. Uh, when we uh, use, when we transfer learn from adult to pediatric glioma, we, we got the best results. Um, primarily, we think because the adult glioma data set is a larger data set where we have almost about a thousand samples versus only 200 samples uh, in pediatric glioma. As you can see, so this is uh, uh, also we compared direct transfer learning, so where we just uh, immediately apply the model directly on the pediatric data without fine tuning. And we also did an, exa an uh, experiment with 50% uh, training data fine tuning, where we see that fine tuning the data definitely improves uh, the performance in terms of transfer learning. Uh, finally, uh, we also wanted to see if these uh, models could be used in these more, much more rare um, pediatric ependymoma and medulloblastoma data. Um, and what is important about that is because these are quite rare tumor subtypes, it will always be very difficult to train uh, models for these diseases uh, only using data from, uh, from these diseases. Therefore, we want to develop transfer learning settings where we can uh, get optimal performance predicting survival for these patients. So in terms of medulloblastoma, uh, we tried uh, transfer learning from the adult model to uh, these diseases. And what we found was that um, when we used transfer learning, uh, we uh, were able to, in uh, almost all cases, both the single models and also the uh, data fusion models to improve the performance and to also reduce the variability across a number of um, uh, repetitions of uh, sampling the training and the testing data. Uh, and this was definitely true for the medulloblastoma. Uh, and to a lesser extent uh, for the ependymoma data. Um, finally, um, we also looked into uh, interpretation uh, of, the, of the models that we developed. Uh, so this is for the adult uh, brain tumor model. We looked at the interpretation of the images and, and this is a, a poor survival case where we are highlighting the using a saliency map, the areas of high saliency um, in the image and the areas that are most uh, helpful in predicting the outcome. And uh, we found that in this case, for example, it is pointing to areas of uh, necrotic single cells and uh, uh, apoptotic cells. Similarly, for uh, this uh, good survival case, so this is a patient that was accurately predicted uh, to have a good survival. Um, the areas of high saliency are pointing to areas of less cellularity, um, and uh, which is a marker for uh, good uh, survival. Uh, similarly, we uh, looked in this uh, integrated model also at the interpretation of the uh, RNA model uh, by looking at the importance, uh, not at the single gene level, but at the pathway level uh, in, in this integrated model. Uh, and we found that um, especially the RAS pathway and the cell cycle pathway are um, indicative of poor prognosis, whereas a couple of other pathways, uh, especially RENX3 and probiotic pathways are um, indicative of uh, good prognosis, um, consistent with the literature and consistent with um, known uh, uh, relationships of these pathways with survival. In particular, for example, RENX3 ha has been reported as a tumor suppressor in glioma. Uh, 
So to summarize this part, so these are some preliminary uh, results uh, specifically on brain tumors, adult and pediatric brain tumors, uh, to see if we can develop uh, models that can improve uh, survival prediction across modalities. Um, we also want to test transfer learning settings, and, and there's still uh, some work that we need to do to improve these models and see if we can uh, transfer knowledge uh, from adults to pediatric uh, and to rare pediatric uh, brain tumors. And finally, we did some pr very preliminary work in interpretation of these models. So to, to summarize um, some of the examples that I gave you today about our work in, in data fusion, and especially linking imaging and molecular data, um, we believe that we can develop these models that to successfully integrate heterogeneous data and that they really can help in improving the predictions, uh, especially across uh, several tumor types. Um, and also that multi-scale modeling uh, shows that molecular biology properties can be reflected in other types of data, such as histopathology images uh, and also in radiographic images um, and can be used to study clinical outcomes. And we believe that a promising application is then also non-invasive uh, precision medicine where we can use imaging, for example, as a proxy of molecular uh, pathway activities uh, that then can be used for uh, treatment allocation for, uh, for example, in the context of patients where biopsy is not uh, straightforward. So, the, so essentially imaging can be a biomarker to make treatment decisions and to predict treatment response. Um, these are the people I have to acknowledge and thank for this work and uh, several sources of funding, and I'm happy to answer any questions.